All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining me today. This is a 30 minute workshop, um, but I will hang out a few minutes afterwards if anyone has questions and we can have a conversation. Um, we're all here for the workshop set up Google Scholar to connect with library resources from home. My name is Gina Schlesemann Tarango and I am an associate librarian at the FAO library. Um, I should note that we are recording this session. You might have gotten a notification when you logged in, but I always like to alert people to that fact. Um, again, if you want to use the chat today, if you have any questions or you, um, there's, it's a small group today, so feel free to your, use your mic as well. That's fine. So we're going to look at three questions today. The first is, what is Google Scholar? I'll cover um, some misconceptions surrounding what it is and what it covers, um, as well as address some of its um, affordances and limitations. We'll also um, briefly address how we can best search Google Scholar. I'll show you some um, smart or advanced searches and point out some of the features um, you might not be aware of. And then finally, um, I will cover the meat and potatoes, what we're all here for, how we can get access um, to file library resources, how we can get those to show up in our Google Scholar searches. But before we dive in, I would like to take a quick poll here. Um, you should see this on your screen now. So I'm asking, how does Google Scholar fit into your research? I only or mostly use it, I occasionally use it, or I never use it. So go ahead and um, make your selection. All right, so I see one response, I never use it. All right, our second attendee might be having a little a little trouble with the poll, um, but that's great. That gives me an idea of our familiarity um, with Google Scholar. And I should say too, this workshop is not necessarily about advocating for or against use of Google Scholar. Um, I like to tell people, okay, second person says I occasionally use it. Great. Um, I like to I like to tell people it's um, not a bad tool to use. It's just different from some of the um, traditional library research databases. Um, I personally like to use them um, sort of in conjunction. I'll run a search in the library databases and then um, do the same search in Google Scholar just to make sure I've covered everything. And I have um, a chat popping up here. I'm gonna end the poll, let me look at that. Ah, got it. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So what is Google Scholar? It's scholarly, you would think, right? Because it's got the name and the title. Well, the answer is it's mostly scholarly. Um, Google Scholar um, does pull pull up and index and display um, a lot of peer reviewed um, scholarly articles from academic journals. Um, it does retrieve information from Google Books, and so you are getting some of those scholarly or academic books, but it's also pulling a lot of other stuff. So one of the places that it pulls information from is um, institutional repositories. Our institutional repository at CSUSB is called ScholarWorks, and these are essentially archives of all of the stuff created at a university. Um, and so for ours, that includes things like peer-reviewed articles that faculty publish and put on there. Could include also conference presentations, um, but it also includes things like um, student journals, minutes from various campus uh, committees and meetings, um, dissertations and theses that graduate students produce, um, newsletters. I know the FAO Library newsletter appears on Google Scholar because it lives in ScholarWorks. And so um, just keep in mind that that is going to appear. Also um, non-scholarly content from academic journals. So things like news sections, um, book reviews, editorials, announcements, those are going to appear too. And so it's really sort of a mixed bag. Google Scholar, we assume, is expertly curated like a library database. Not quite. Um, Google Scholar 
actually relies on ro robots behind the scenes to crawl academic publishers, professional societies, repositories, etc. And it looks for documents that are structured in a certain way. Um, publishers can also request that their information be included and individual scholars can upload whatever they want. I tested this the other day and I basically put up a blank document. So it's not curated. It's all sort of happening behind the behind the scenes with, with Google scholars. Um, robots that are crawling information so it doesn't have that level of vetting that something like a library database does and finally we can say well at least it has everything and that is not the case i don't believe you <laughs> we should be skeptical so google scholar indexes a lot of content and a lot of that stuff um, is content that our library databases don't have um, such as a lot of the open access journal content um, however, um, there's content that you have to have a subscription to or have an account to, for example, that Google Scholar doesn't include. Also, as I mentioned, if a journal, for example, doesn't format um, their content to the specifications that Google Scholar's robots require to crawl and retrieve it, it's not going to show up there. Um, and so, again, as I mentioned, Google Scholar and the library databases are best used um, as, you know, sort of two sides of the same research coin. I like to do one, a search in a library database and do the same search in Google Scholar. You're going to see a lot of the same stuff, but a lot of unique content as well. Other considerations, um, I always like to point out that Google Scholar is a part of Google, which is and it, an advertising company, essentially. Um, it's part of the, the Alphabet company. And so um, I'll just open this up really quick. If you have concerns, um, you can visit their privacy policy. And they here is where they cover information about um, apps, browsers, devices, your location information, et cetera, um, and what you can and can't do about that. So I always like to point that out. Um, Google Scholar itself is not um, a product that makes money for Google, which is kind of interesting. So that's why you don't see advertises on your Google Scholar search itself, like you do if you're just doing a generic Google search. Um, but it, again, it's subject to these same sort of um, privacy implications. All right, so let's go ahead and dive in. Um, I'm going to start off by showing some Google search tips, Google Scholar search tips and techniques, and then we'll cover how to link library resources that we have at the file library to Google Scholar. Let me go ahead and open it up here. So when you land on the Google Scholar um, page and the, the, the URL is scholar.google.com, um, you see a search bar just like Google. The default is to search articles right here. Um, you can also use Google Scholar to search case law. Um, we're not going to have time to cover that today, but just keep that in mind. Um, I am logged into my account. You can see my picture up here on the right. Um, if you if you have a Gmail account, you essentially have a Google Scholar account, um, and you would just need to log in with your Gmail address to access that. And I'll cover some of what you can do with an account later. Um, I see recommended articles. These are based on um, my own library of articles, things I've published, alerts that I've signed up for. And then down here, I see articles about COVID-19. If there's ever an issue that's sort of trending or um, you know, of, of importance like COVID-19, they try to highlight some of those things down here. So let's go ahead and do a search here. Um, there's been a lot of talk lately about um, like uninsured children um, and school lunches, right? With all of the schools closed. And so <clears throat> I go ahead and type in my key terms and I get my list of results. Like in a library database, um, to the left and sometimes to the right, depending on what database you're using, you're gonna see what are called limiters. Now in a library database, usually there's a little checkbox um, that says peer reviewed article or peer reviewed journals. And if you click that, you can be um, assured that everything you see is a peer reviewed article. Google Scholar does not have such a thing. Um, there's no way also over here to limit by the source type. So if I just wanted to see book chapters, I'm still gonna have to look through all this. If I just wanna see peer reviewed articles, I'm gonna look 
through all this. If I just want to see books, I'm going to have to look through all of that. So that is one of the limitations is that lack of limiting by um, source type. You also can't limit by subject. So in a database, if I were to do this search, um, there might be the option to select, um, I want articles that are from um, health or medical journals, or I want articles that are from a more sociological perspective um, or an education perspective. There's no such thing here. What we do have instead is a date limiter. So we can create a custom range if we want, say we want content published from 2010 to 2018. You can do that. Um, we also have the option here to include patents. Um, so if, I don't know, if you're interested in patents, you can do that. Um, also citations. What, what they mean by citations here is that sometimes there are articles that appear on this list um, that you can't click on them and get any more information. They're going to be listed in all black. And this one here says HTML in brackets. It's going to say citation. That means that um, there's no full text that's available for us. And there's also not even um, like a journal web page that it can take us to to get the abstract. You're just going to get this the title and the authors um, and the name of the journal typically. I recommend that we leave this box checked because if you see that, you'll be able to um, at least search for it in the library's database and see if we can get it. Um, if we don't have it, get it for you through interlibrary loan. So I do recommend just leaving that box checked. The other thing you can do, which I, I like to use, is create alert over here. What this will do is it will create an alert for new sources that are added to um, this search. So if I created an alert, every time a new source um, was added to Google Scholar or indexed to Google Scholar about uninsured children and school lunches, um, I would get an update. I believe I have mine set up to update me monthly, um, so I don't you know, get emails every day. But that's a really useful way to sort of keep track of a topic. And you can set up an alert query for an author's name, too. So if you just want information by an author, that's a way to use that tool as well. OK. So as far as searching Google Scholar, we can do a keyword search like we've done up here. We can also search for an author. So the easiest way to do that is to type in author, colon, and then um, you can see I was playing around with this earlier. Sarah Ahmed, that's um, an author I sometimes read her work. You're going to do Ahmed colon or comma Sarah. Um, <clears throat> and that's usually the way we see names formatted in databases. But with Google Scholar, you depending on where they're getting the information from, it might be formatted differently. So we could do Sarah Ahmed or we could do S Ahmed. <clears throat> and so on and so forth. Um, if it's a common name like S. Ahmed, you might have to kind of look through. Um, I know, for example, the author I'm thinking about um, is not writing about obstetric hemorrhaging. <laughs> She's a, a women's studies um, and cultural studies author. So I know this isn't her. Um, so you might have to, because Google Scholar is pulling so much information, you might have to sort of sort through these um, results a little bit. Um, what you can do too is, I'm going to remove this, is go over to this, um, they call it a hamburger icon, but these three lines on the top left, and we can pop down to advanced search. And there, this is where we can get kind of fancy here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and remove what I had already typed in. So here we have the options to find articles with all of the words we type in or an exact phrase, which essentially means you want to pull up words in a certain order um, or you want articles with at least one of the words. So let's say I were doing research on, I don't know, like house cats or something. I might want felines or cats or house cats or domestic cats. But I, without the words, I don't want anything about tigers or lions, right? Um, I'm not interested in big cats. 
You can also search um, for your words to appear anywhere in the article or just in the title. I'm going to go ahead and select just in the title. And then here you can also search by an author. You can search for a journal and then your date option as well. So let's go ahead and narrow my results down. All right, so I, I can see up here I have 51,700 results. Um, and just like a library database, your results are going to be different depending on the order of your keywords. So um, it's always good to sort of mix those up and play around with synonyms or related terms if you're not finding what you like. All right, a couple of things I mentioned, if you are logged in um, to Google, you you have an account. And I know I'm logged in because I have my image up here. It might be your initials, however you have that set up. But one, one thing that I like to do with Google Scholar is if I find sources that I like, I'm going to go ahead and star those. And when I do that, um, that means I'm plopping them here in the right top right into my library. And then this is where they'll live. What's nice is that I can um, create labels and that's essentially like creating little folders for, for different um, sources that I like. I can sort them by um, time frame, and so this is just another way to sort of organize um, your research. Other options um, under the sources here, your results, is we have our, um, cite, our uh, quotation marks. This allows you to create a citation for the source that you find. Um, just like in our databases, it will create them in different styles for you. However, I think Google Scholar citations have a lot more errors than the ones I've seen in the database citation generators, um, a lot more. So just like with those, you're going to, it's fine to copy and paste them, but you'll just need to clean them up um, to adhere to whatever citation guidelines you're using. If you use um, uh, citation management software, um, there are options down here to export your citations, BibTeX, and Note RefMan and RefWorks. Unfortunately, I know a lot of us use Zotero. Um, Google Scholar isn't linked up to Zotero at this time, and I'm not sure if they're ever going to do that. <laughs> I'm hoping I'm hoping they do, um, but I personally use RefWorks, and it, it does work pretty seamlessly with that. Um, you can also do some citation chasing in Google Scholar, and what I mean by that is here it says cited by 3,635. If I click on this, I will get a list of items that cite this book. And so that's a good way if you're a professor, you can share this with your students or if you're doing your own research to kind of um, follow the com scholarly conversation forward and see who cited that item. I'm going to pop back here. It also get, will give you a list of related articles, which is um, helpful. And then um, all 11 versions will just take you to different versions that they that Google Scholar has found online. So it might be a version from a publisher. It might be a version from um, maybe the author has a professional website. They uploaded it. It might be a version from an institutional repository. And so um, if you're interested in that, um, you can just click on that and then you'll get um, the list of the versions here. <clears throat> it can be a little overwhelming, like this has 11 versions and you might be a little confused about which version um, is the best one. If that ever happens to you, shoot me an email um, and I'd be happy to help you determine which one to use. Okay, um, so the other thing I wanted to show you before we talk about ac accessing the information is um, author profiles. So if you notice on this third result, we have Jay Serpel, the author, and it's underlined. What that means is that this scholar has set up a Google Scholar profile. And here's James, um, and it tells you he's a professor of animal welfare at University of Pennsylvania. Um, and what I love about this is it's a quick way to get access to all of their stuff. And I say stuff because, um, again, Google Scholar pulls a lot of different content. So this could be scholarly peer-reviewed articles he has published. It could be books he's written, could be conference presentation materials he might have uploaded to his institutional repository or a personal website. Um, but what's great about this is this cited by, again, we can see all of the sources um, that have cited this work. And what it does by default is it pops 
the item that is cited the most at the top. So we can see that this is his most popular or most cited work. Um, the year is 1996. He has more recent stuff, but that's not showing first because it doesn't have as many citations. Over here on the right, we also have a list of co-authors, and these are folks who have Google Scholar profiles. Um, and so just another way to, to follow folks. I find I love to point grad students to these because you can find things, again, like conference presentations, maybe preprints of articles that you wouldn't find in a normal library database search. Um, again, these folks can also upload whatever they want, so you do want to be a little cautious. I'm going to pop into my profile. Let's see here. Um, my profile and show you that I can upload whatever I want. So on the bottom here, I uploaded test and it's it's nothing. So just just be a little careful. Um, I haven't necessarily heard of this myself, but I imagine, you know, if there was a, a scholar out there who wanted to sort of um, make it look like they published more than they actually have, they, you know, they might add stuff there. But like I said, I haven't personally heard of anyone doing that. All right. <clears throat> so as far as getting resources, let's go ahead and do a search here. I'll continue with my uninsured children in school lunches. Now, <clears throat> When you are looking at your results set, if you if you find a title you're interested in and you want the full text, you want to read it, what you're going to want to do is look to the right. This over here on the right where it says PDF or in this case HTML, this tells you you're able to access it. You'll simply click on the item and it should open up. And here it is. Um, if it's a PDF, a PDF file will open up and you can download and save it. Now, there are sources, this one, for example, where I don't see anything to the right. What's going to happen is we're going to click on the title. And we might be taken to the journal. And we'll see the abstract. And we're thinking, oh, great, I'll just download the PDF. And let's see here, it will tell me okay, log in, give me your institutional login, or in this case, pay me 25 bucks for this article. The reason is that, I'm gonna go back to Google Scholar. This article is simply indexed here, meaning it is listed. It, it, the, it, the full access is not available here. And so what you can do to sort of help you work around some of these cases where you encounter this is, we're going back to our top left, our hamburger icon, and we're going into settings at the very bottom. And we're going down to library links. And what we're going to do is add the FAO library. So if we have access to it, are able to link to it through our library databases, that shows up in your search. I'll show you what I mean in a moment. I'm gonna type in CSUSB library, do search, and click on CSUSB library, find it at CSUSB. This is going to appear in our results that where we're able to link to the item. By the way, if you perhaps um, teach at or attend another university, you can type in that university um, and their library links. Most libraries do have this set up. Theirs will show up as well. If you're simply curious about, I don't know, for example, uh, what Harvard has, um you could add that too uh, you know unless you're able to log in to their resources you're not going to get it but i sometimes just play around with this to see you know who has what but we're going to leave it at csusb library um, it also defaults to open worldcat library search you're going to want to leave that that just um, allows this library function to to function so leave that alone as well i'm going to hit save and so now we can see on the right, we're seeing find it at CSUSB, find it at CSUSB. Um, I believe that one, yeah, the one that we clicked on, let's click on find it at CSUSB and see what happens. What's, what's, what it's doing now is popping you into one search. Um, and unfortunately, it says file library does not have you have a copy of this one. Um, and it, the first thing you see is check for a ver free version in Google Scholar. 
you're not going to do that. Obviously, we were just in Google Scholar. But what you can do at this point is click here, get this article through interlibrary loan, and we will get it for you um, for free from another library. I know um, we have a partial campus closure right now due to COVID-19, but if you're requesting an article, we can absolutely still do that. Um, those are all PDFs. They're going to be sent electronically. What we can't do as far as interlibrary loan is um, books and book chapters, unfortunately. Um, but articles are completely fine. Let's go try to find one that, here we go, find it at CSUSB that we probably are able to get for you or that we have. Again, it's popping me into Google Scholar. Aha. And this one, it says available online at Science Direct Journals. I would just click there. It would plot me into our database. Since we're all home, you're going to be prompted to sign in with your um, Coyote ID and password. But after that point, um, the full text will be available to you um, either as HTML or a PDF for you to download. So that's really it. Just making sure, again, I'll, I'll walk through that again. We went in the top left, our hamburger icon, and we went down to settings at the bottom, library links, and then typed in CSUSD library and made sure we save that in our settings. And so it's a pretty quick process. If ever um, you don't see, I'm going to forward a few pages here. Um, this one, for example, example at the bottom, we don't see a CSUSB, um, get it, find it at CSUSB. And that's simply because um, it's what's happening behind the scenes. We're not able to parse the link. So in that case, what you could do is copy the title, do a search in one search on our home page um, and see if we have it. And if not, you'll be presented with that option to request it through interlibrary loan. Okay. So really quickly, I just want to point out, um, we do have a library guide for Google Scholar. This is the website and I'll go ahead, open that and I'll plop that, um, this link into the, the chat. So you have this. Let's see here. There you go. Um, and this really walks you through how to set up that library link, as well as things to consider about Google Scholar. And this is a lot of um, what I covered in um, the beginning of today's presentation. So um, it's a, just about 1230. Um, the final thing I ask is that if you have a moment, if you would just please complete this quick survey, I'm going to plop this into the chat as well. Um, it should just take a moment, but we always like to get feedback so we can improve our improve our presentations. Um, and then I'll also take any questions if if you'd like me to cover anything again or yeah, anything that came up, I'm happy to answer that now.